All right, Matthew chapter 1, if you would turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, we'll start reading in verse 18 <clears throat> through verse 25. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ <clears throat> was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till he had brought forth his firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Father, we thank you for <clears throat> this time of year the observation of the incarnation of your only begotten Son. We thank you for the reading of your word, which records the story in factual detail. And we thank you for preserving it for us here today. We don't have any crazy ideas about who Mary was or that she was normal in the sense of... of uh, childbearing with Joseph, but that she was a virgin, and that the Lord Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost to this virgin girl. Uh, it's an important part of what we believe about the truth of your word, and we're glad that we, we have that, and I hope that we don't fall into to the temptation to uh, make it look like she was something other than what she was. We thank you for saving each and every one of us who have called on you in faith, trusting in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, receiving, receiving him by faith as Savior. We pray for anyone who hasn't, that they would just see themselves as you see them. And if they're lost, they would become so dissatisfied, not only with who they are not, but the end result, which would be an eternity separated from you, the Lord Jesus Christ, loved ones that are saved, first in hell and then in the lake of fire. So I speak to our hearts here today. Uh, there's a lot of things to overcome in our world. Uh, here, even among our church people, and even among me as a speaker, uh, <clears throat> I don't know what you're going to do or how you're going to do it, but I know it's not me that can do it. So I just pray that you'd uh, be with all of us, that the Holy Spirit would have his way in everything that transpires here, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> when I was reading that, there was something that I knew and uh, for some reason didn't tie it together. Uh, in verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people for their sins. And then, in verse 23, a virgin shall be with child and bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. If you have any doubts about who Jesus is, it's right there. Doesn't get any plainer than that. So this is a familiar story. It happens every year, like your birthday happens every year. But this birthday observation is unlike any other. For in the incarnation, we have the second person of the Godhead taking on human flesh, coming to this earth, yet still being God. And so like every year before, we celebrate the earth with, I mean, his, this birth with great reverence for the sake of the truth which God has revealed to us in his holy word. Now the truth, 
That's a pretty novel idea in the day in which we live, isn't it? Uh, hold your place here. Go uh, back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 59. And in the middle of what the Lord is saying to the Israelites, verse 14, and judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Is that not an adequate picture of today? And actually, truth has come under attack not long after the very first verse that predicts the, the Messiah in God's word in Genesis 3.15, uh, that there would be someone that would come and take away the debt of sin for mankind. So now we come to Matthew, and just about 4,000 years have, have passed since that prophecy, and still there were people looking this is incredible. There are still people looking for the Messiah to come. And we'll get to that in a little bit. In our reading, many critical things unfolded essential to the truth of what was prophesied and now recorded as actual fact. Number one, Joseph ultimately marrying Mary, Jesus became the legal heir to the throne of Judah. When a king takes a throne, it is by birth. Number two, through Mary, is the scriptural right to the throne. Christ was the only one that could be of the family of David legally and yet not of, be of the same blood. So Christ had to be the Messiah. If he's not, the Jews never will have a Messiah because Herod, uh, Titus came into the temple in 70 AD, destroyed everything, all the genealogical records where they were stored. There was nothing. No Jew, other than maybe the Levites, can lay claim to what tribe they belong to. They don't know. They just don't know. So we ask what Jewish person, number one, can claim to be of the tribe of Judah? What Jewish person can claim to be born of the family of David? What Jewish person can claim to be virgin born? or can claim to be have put to death for the sins not of himself, but for the sins of all mankind, or can claim a literal bodily resurrection. There's only one, only, only one, only Jesus Christ can. So I have a few, a few uh, things that I want to get to. Most are simple. I think we're going to agree with them. We should, we should agree with them. Uh, some, I think, have been neglect neglected and therefore have become subjects of, uh, hey, what's the big deal about all this? Uh, there's not a whole lot new that you could add to what is written, because we go over this all the time. But there are things that you can see and that you can highlight that have been highlighted before, but repetition is theological glue. And the more you hear it, the more it's going to stick. So I want to start in Galatians 4. Galatians chapter 4. The subject matter hasn't changed. We have different light given to us in Galatians concerning what we just read. Galatians 4, and look here in verse 4. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoptions of sons. All right, when the fullness of time was come, basically we're talking about when the right time appeared, when, when everything had fallen into place. If you were looking at a jar, when the jar was completely filled, there's no more you could add to the jar. You couldn't take anything away from it. It was completely full. The Messiah came, made of only a woman without the use of a man. 
made under the law to redeem them that were under the law. In Luke chapter 2, let's turn there. Luke chapter 2, we see these circumstances perfectly played out. And it came to pass, verse 1, in those days there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea and to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary as his spouse's wife, being great with child. And so it was, while they were there, <clears throat> the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the same field, in the field, keeping watch over their, the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, <clears throat> shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So Caesar Augustus, uh, had to be on the throne and continue what we know as a birth tax uh, started by Cyrenius, governor of Syria. What made this different was that Joseph was espoused to Mary and they were both of the house of David. And by the time they arrived, obviously there are no vacancies in Bethlehem, it's a very small village, and they were allowed to stay in the stable area. And when the Lord Jesus was born, put in the food trough uh, that night. Then the story switches to the shepherds, who are allowed to be the first earthly witnesses of the truth of this birth. Verse 15, came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, let us now go into Bethlehem. <clears throat> See this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord hath made known unto us. They came with haste, found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the, sh by the shepherds. So <clears throat> the message was received with skepticism. Because these were shepherds. These were not the nobles of the city. These were considered to be the lower class of the city. Hardly ever were they allowed into town. And it mattered very little what the people thought. They went and gave the message. The great lesson for us there, doesn't matter who you are and what your class standing is, if the Lord gives you the message and he's given us the message, you give it out. So the story continues on the eighth day, and under the law of Leviticus chapter 12, they circumcised him and then called his name Jesus. Now, before we go on, look down at verse 25, told about a priest. Behold, there was a man in Jerusalem, his name is Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Now, again, this is 4,000 years, and he is looking for the Messiah to come. How many of us, let's say 25 years, are still looking for the Lord to return, as we did 25 years ago, or 50 years ago? 4,000 years, it was like it's brand new. And, and so he was looking, verse 26, and it was revealed to him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple when he, 
when the parents brought the ch in the child to do, af do for him after the custom of the Jew, then took the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. He recognized there was a twofold recognition. Number one, who he was by the Holy Spirit. And number two, supernatural intervention. I mean, not supernatural, but the prophecy of the prophets, the prophecies of the prophets. And all of that, he was able to connect things together. And he knew exactly who he was. Also, down in verse 38 or 36, and there was one Anna, a prophetess, of the daughter, daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asser, who was of a great age and had lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. She was a widow of about four score and four years, who departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers day and night and day. And she coming in in that instant gave likewise unto the Lord and spake of him to all that looked for redemption in Jerusalem. It's amazing. Uh, look at how far we've drifted. Let's, let's just take independent fundamental Baptist churches. Look how far independent fundamental Baptist churches have drifted within a hundred years. Away. And here are two people. There are probably more, but there's only two mentioned. They haven't drifted at all. They're still looking. They're still faithful. And then Simeon is told, you're not going to die. You're going to see him. Jesus came just at the right time. None of the circumstances or prophecies could have been altered and still been the right time. Okay, go with me to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. This is a story of the wise men. These were people who, in different, I guess it all depends on who you're going to read, were either astrologers or magicians or people that studied constellations. Uh, they're called the wise men here. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, <clears throat> in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, all Jerusalem with him. When he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, that shall rule my people Israel. <clears throat> and Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Liar. <laughs> That's my addition, by the way. <laughs> when they heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child who was Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. All right, so uh, these are people that had knowledge of a star. Uh, Numbers 24, 17 is where that, that prophecy is. I don't believe they had scriptural knowledge of that star. I think they would have had some kind of, somebody down through the ages, De Deuteronomy was written a long time ago, picked up something about that, and they, they put that in their mix of things that they were looking at. And suddenly this group, whomever they were, saw a star. It was not a normal star. 
It was a supernatural star. So there had to be a source. We know that the ultimate source is the word, but it had to be through hand, word of mouth, and then tradition and so forth. And uh, that, that star, by the way, was only seen by the wise men. No one else saw that star. Everybody's all to do about the planets lining up when? Tomorrow. It's going to be a bright star. It's at Christmas. It's not a bright star. It's two planets. You know? And, uh, and so the priests the priest knew the passage. That's the tragedy. But they didn't see the star either. They knew where the, the Messiah was to be born, but they never saw it. So they're encouraged to look in Bethlehem. Now, the wise men didn't know that. And so the star appears to them again and leads them to where? Verse 11. And when they were come into the stable, no, the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother. Okay. Uh, and then they gave him gifts for a king, gold, uh, but then frankincense, which was a, a bitter herb-smelling uh, aroma. I think it signified the rejection. And myrrh, which was a picture of death, usually used it as an embalming agent to keep the smell of death off of, off of the body when it was wrapped uh, with, with these, these uh, spices. And uh, I wanted you to notice one thing here in verse 11. The response of the presence of Christ was that they worshiped him by giving him gifts. They had prepared to see the king. They found a baby. They identified him as the king. They worshiped him as the king. And so I ask, how often are we moved by the presence of Christ by giving something to him? Not gold, frankincense, and myrrh. To the resurrected Christ. Romans chapter 12. Hold your place here. Well, yeah, hold your place. We'll come back. Romans chapter 12. I'm only going to read one verse because one verse would be sufficient. And if you could get a, a grip of one verse, you would easily get the grip on the second verse. Verse 1, I beseech you therefore, you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What can we give to him? We have nothing to give to him except ourselves in total. And that's only reasonable. If we could do that, then whatever verse 2 says, be not conformed to this, to this world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable, perfect will of God would, would flow from us. But we like, to lay, we like to labor on verse 2 when we ignore verse 1. We haven't given ourselves to the Lord holy. And so we can enter into his presence. His presence is within us. And, and we don't think of a thing about giving him ourselves. But, our, but things. It's, it's he, us that he wants. Proverbs, Solomon said to his son, my son, give me thine heart. That's what he wants. So back to the house in verse 11. Why were they still in the house? The only reason they came there is because they were from, they were, they were, uh, uh, their origin was in Bethlehem and they came to be taxed. That's the only reason they were there. So what's the time frame here? Well, in the gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you've got to remember that except for the last chapter 
of each book, the law of the Old Testament was in effect. So in Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, in verse 21, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, the name, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So on the eighth day after the birth of Christ, they go to the temple at Jerusalem to have him circumcised. In verse 22, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So there were seven days where Mary had to be ceremonially purified and then they circumcised them on the eighth day. So go back to Leviticus chapter 12. Leviticus chapter 12. Okay, and the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel. If a woman hath conceived seed and born a man-child, then she shall be unclean seven days. So there's, there's the, the purpose of the eighth day. One day born, seven days unclean. According to the days of the separation of her infirmity shall be, she be unclean. And in the eighth day the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised, all right? So they, they did perfectly according to the law, unclean seven, circumcised on the eighth day. But now watch verse four. And she shall, be, shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and 30 days. She shall touch no hallowed thing, nor come into the sanctuary until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. So after the eight days, she waits 33 more days for her ceremonial and body, bodily purification, whereupon verse 6, when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. They bring a sacrifice to the priest who then offers it, verse 7, before the Lord to make an atonement for her and she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. This is the law for her that hath born a male or a female. By the way, there was somebody in the New Testament that had issue of blood. Go back to the Old Testament you find out what it was. Um, priest makes an atonement for her, and she is cleansed from her issue of blood. So let me put some of this together. Christ is born in Bethlehem, stays there seven more days, goes to Jerusalem to have him circumcised. There we find Simeon and Anna. I believe they were, I think they were representative of a remnant of believers. I don't think they were the only ones, but a remnant of believers awaiting and looking for the Messiah according to the many Old Testament prophecies of his coming, many of which we are very familiar with. Okay, we too are faced with a remnant looking for the Lord's return for us in the rapture. Paul was looking. I can brought it out. Paul was looking in, Thess in Thessalonians. He was looking for him to return. He hasn't returned yet. Don't you think all through the Old Testament that there were people who were looking for him to come the first time? Yes. And now we're looking for him to come for us. And I believe it's a remnant of people because there's more and more groups getting away from this and giving me all these different theories. We have Second Peter says, hey, you guys that believe he's going to come, where is he? 
hasn't shown up. No, he hasn't. But won't you be surprised when he does? Because he is. He will be. And by now, they're no longer in the stable, but in a house where they remain for at least 31 more days. Somewhere in those 33 days, more likely toward the end than the beginning, the wise men show up and bring their gifts. Now, I've read inconsequentially two, two articles about this, this thing with the wise men. And both of them are similar, but they leave something out. And, and that's this. Three things transpire uh, afterwards. In Matthew chapter 2, look at verse 12. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another, another way. So the wise men are warned of God that, about Herod, and they leave to go back to where they came from another way. In verse 13 through 15, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and, they, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And it was there till the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. All right. So... They leave, they were commanded to leave. They left there to the death of Herod. Now go back to Luke chapter two. Luke chapter two. Verse 39. And when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned unto Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and waxed strong in the spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. So when they were told to go back, they didn't go back to Bethlehem. They went to Nazareth. That's where they were from. There would be no reason to go to Bethlehem. They went, he was a carpenter, Joseph the carpenter. They went back to where he lived and worked. And from that point on, you hear nothing about Christ until he's 12 years old. Now, why is it, well, let me, let, me, let me do something else. There were two forces at work here during these 41 days after the birth of Christ. Actually, they were, all, they were already at work, according to, I think, Second Thessalonians in chapter 2, uh, the mystery of iniquity has been at work for a long, long time. Number one, at first there was homage rendered for he who was to become a king. Secondly, there was hatred toward him by Herod. Okay, so in 2,000 years, has anything changed? People who are wise will worship him. People who hate him are continued. Look, look how today... Even the Jews and the world hate Christ. I mean, at this point, they had no reason to, because they didn't know what was going to happen. We, we put a high premium upon truth. And why shouldn't we? If we don't have the truth, then what good is any of this? So where do we find truth? Well, all of these are found in the book of John 17, John chapter 17. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You're holding truth in your laps. You're looking at truth on a screen. 
John 14. And look at verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Thy word is truth. Jesus Christ is truth because Jesus Christ is the word. John chapter 8. In verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Verse 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. All right, John chapter 4. In verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The word is truth. Jesus Christ is truth. The truth will set you free, and, and free indeed. And now, John 4, you're free to worship God in spirit and in truth because that is the only acceptable way God will accept worship. He does not accept the flesh. He does not accept the performances and the worldliness. I don't care who says it, who, who promotes it. He does not accept it. You can have 45 minutes of nothing but praise and rock and roll and everything else. Oh, this is a, we are worshiping. We are worshiping him. Who? It's not acceptable to God because it's not in the spirit and it's not by truth. The incarnation, God becoming flesh, while still being God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So here we come to why are you making a big deal about I haven't even talked about the number of wise men, did I? Did the, did, the, did the word speak about how many wise men there were? No. Where did three come from? Oh, from the gifts. So they rode three camels. You, you've, you come, you're coming a long way from wherever you came from. In all likelihood, Babylon, somewhere in that area. It's taking you a long time to get to Jerusalem. And normally you come in caravans. There had, there had to be multitudes of people, camels, goods, food. It's not like you could stop at the 7-Eleven in the middle of a desert and re reload. You had to have everything with you. So I'm not going to say anything. All I know is there's more than one. Right. And I can rest with that. All right? Why did we put the wise men at the birth of Christ? Who started that? And why is, why is, that, why is that not important? I mean, the fact that they came and they, and they worshiped him and they gave these gifts, that's important. But why isn't time important? In the fullness of time, at the right time, God sent forth his only begotten son to come into this world, born of a virgin. In the fullness of time, the wise men came. It was, things happen at the right time. They don't happen at the wrong time. Then they got the, the virus at the right time. I got the virus, and Micah got it, and Libby got it, and, and uh, the eagles got it. And Judy got it. It was all at the right time. And we managed to get through that. Same thing with Diana. And she's fighting. These are what I just don't understand why we, you know, we sing if we three kings of Orion are. Well, that's, that's a nice hymn. But why does them say, you know, we many kings of Orient are? Because we don't know. And it becomes, the tradition becomes a doctrine. And, and you go by nativity places, and many of those places have wise men. 
these, when Sue had this done, uh, who knows how long ago did she have those done? Older than you, probably. Uh, there's wise men over there with camels. And, and, and when we came here, I said, Sue, the wise men weren't there. What? I never knew that. Well, the tradition is put wives in there. It's heartwarming. It's just wrong, that's all. I'm not going to make a big deal of that. Again, we put a high premium on truth, and we should. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ lived a perfect, sinful, sinless life. Going to a cross where he took to himself the sin of all of us and paid the price in full with his blood, which none of us could ever pay. He died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. The, the offer thereby is made to all of us that are here, all of us that are watching, to you. Believe what he did was sufficient. Believe that he, that he is who he said he is, and what he did was sufficient to pay the debt to save us, and we call on him in faith and receive him by faith alone as our Savior and have the guarantee of eternal life, or we call him a liar. By trying to believe the lies that religion teaches you, you can, you can do better to take a political statement. You can do better, and you can, you can make good with God by your efforts and your works or your money or your ceremonies or your rituals, which can never get you back to God. What a great day. Every time we do this, what a great day to receive him as your savior and receive eternal life. If you're here lost, what a great day to do that. And if we're saved, what a great time of the year to offer yourself as a living sacrifice to him if you've not done that before. And so we ask, we'll close with a question. Will you take him at his word today? Let's pray. As you bow your heads here this morning, I don't know what it, how it is with your heart. I don't know where you are spiritually, but I do know that Christ came for you. That he was God manifest in the flesh. That he lived a perfect life for you, set the example that only he could be the one who could pay for your sin. When he died, all his blood had been shed in your behalf to make atonement for your sin. And yes, he was buried, he rose again the third day, and he offers you the same thing that everyone who is saved has been offered, salvation through Jesus Christ and him alone. It is not a religion, it is a Bible doctrine. The choice is yours. We who are saved, while we kind of downplay the wise men, they also, did, they also did something with what they had, and they gave of themselves. They had probably more than all of us, but they gave of that. All the Lord asks of you is to give of yourself. Give him all of yourself. Because it's reasonable for what he's done for you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that for Bible believers, and this is a, a time to really draw close to you, and to the truths of your word. I pray you just speak to our hearts here today. I don't know what you're saying. 
don't know what, <coughs> or how you're saying it, but I do know that you have to be speaking to us. Your word guarantees it's a living word. I may, I may butcher it, but it still has more power than I do. And in the face of your word, where do we stand? How do we stand? And there's only one way. It can't be of the flesh. It's got to be through you and the power of the Holy Spirit within us. So have your way in this invitation this morning. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.